similar things that we've been seeing as we move through and we're real close to a transition point. I know maybe you say, well, we're hearing the same things over and over. Again, God wants us to hear that sometimes. But Proverbs 9 is very interesting. There, there is a parallel here between foolishness and wisdom. And God wants us to understand, He's been trying to lay this foundation that we need to choose to have wisdom. We need to choose to avoid foolishness. The choices we make on a daily basis affect us, just as with salvation. And I want to say it's, it's very important to understand that there are, you know, we keep seeing this parallel between the wise and the foolish, the wisdom and the foolishness. And it seems in this chapter to me that we see wisdom fighting against foolishness for the souls. Now listen, we can all do foolish things. You can be saved and you could be that simple man that we were warned about that would go to the adulterous woman. Hey, you could be saved and be that adulterous woman, right? God forbid. But we're warned about those characteristics of the foolish. But there's also this underlying principle in, the, in Proverbs especially about that the saved are the wise and that the unsaved are the foolish. And there's, there's an interesting parallel here we're going to look at where I believe that in this chapter it could be said that the foolish represent the children of the devil, the reprobates. The wise represent the children of God, those that are saved. And there's an attack on the people in the middle. Just as the Bible teaches there are three different types of people, right? There are the children of God, the children of this world, or children of Adam, and then the children of the devil. Well, it's always after the neutral. We go soul winning to get those souls over on our side. The devil spins his lies and puts out his music and entertainment and the lust of the flesh to try to ensnare the souls in the middle so they would go the way to hell. And I think we're going to learn something here in Proverbs tonight where we'll see how there is actually an active battle where the wise are fighting against the foolish and it's God's wisdom ultimately that he uses through people and it's the devil's foolishness that he uses to try to ensnare souls. So I believe we're going to see a salvation parallel here tonight in Proverbs, so pay attention for you soul winners. Let's just start here at verse number one. The Bible reads, Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. Now again here, wisdom being personified, wisdom being talked to as a her, and we'll see it later in the chapter, so is foolishness. There's that foolish woman. She has a house also, and she is trying to get the attention of people. But here we start out with wisdom as a she, building up her house, right? She's not destroying it. And it says she hath hewn out her seven pillars. Now if you're looking for some symbolism in the number seven, that's not too hard to find in the Bible. But be, be a little bit careful with those that are given over to symbolism. You know, um, today there's a lot of uh, mystical religions that do Theomatics, or godly numbers, right? Or gematria, you know, the magic of numbers. You know, that's, that, uh, that's what the occult wants to use. Now, God does use certain numbers certain times for a reason. And if you look through the Bible at pillars and numbers, you're, you'll see one pillar, two pillar, three, four, five, six, seven, ten, twelve, twenty, forty-five. There's all these numbers in the Bibles about pillar pillars, and I don't believe that there's a particular reference here to, to the seven pillars other than seven is oftentimes a godly number. You think about the creation week, it was seven days. Now mind you, God only worked six days, and in that seventh day, He rested, showing the perfection that it was good. A lot of the feast days were a seven-day period or a week-long period. You have the jubilees of seven years and a seven times seven. Um, so we have God's rest on the seventh day. In, in Proverbs, in Psalms 12, we read this on Sunday, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. God says, hey, my word is perfect, it's preserved, it is sevenfold. He uses that number seven there distinctly for a reason. But again, we're not going to be superstitious about the number seven. Um, the, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit. It refers to it as seven spirits before the throne of God is a description of the Holy Spirit. And again, sometimes God uses numbers for significance. I believe He's doing that right here. In the end times, in Revelation, we see that there are seven churches, right? There are seven angels. There are seven seals. There are seven thunders that utter, right? There are seven vials. There are seven plagues. 
there's seven angels. There's so many things in sevens. You know, there, there are seven times in the Bible that we have the name Jehovah. All of this is significant. It's for a sign. It's to get our attention. But yet, don't be too superstitious to the point where if it's not on seven, I won't go. Right? And I know people that get too hung up on these things. You know, in Acts 17, he says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Morris Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. There have been times where God has done things and I see a number like seven or something. I'm like, wow, okay, this must be of God. This is very interesting. Or I find parallels in certain Bibles, you know, or Bible passages rather. Kind of like when we were looking at... Uh, the, the protection, and we looked at several chapters ending in number 22. You know, the significance I pointed out before about verses that are 2020. Everybody knows about Acts 2020, but there are many verses that are 2020 that go hand in hand with that. Well, seven is a number again that God uses for a certain thing, you know. And, you know, let's not be superstitious though. Let's not be so given over into searching for that number that we're paralyzed by fear or we won't move forward. You know, this reminds me of a time I was looking for a new vehicle and I found a vehicle. Man, this is the one. This is the deal. It's got everything I want. I can't believe the price. They're going to accept my, my credit. What? And they're going to let me have it too? And then I see that on the dealer number there, one of the stock numbers, it was a series of numbers and letters, but there were three sixes in a row. I said, whoa, hold on. Uh-oh. Well, I'm, I'm too superstitious to buy this. And it's like, but wait a minute. It's of God. He's opening the doors. My prayer is, Lord, if this ain't of you, close the door. I don't want to be so superstitious that I would, you know, not get something that I think God was providing. And listen, I'm the kind of guy, if, I'm, if I go to the gas station, I get a bottle of water and some crackers, and it rings up at 666, I'm going to find a, let me get that pack of gum, too. I don't chew gum, but I'll buy it. You know, 666, whoa, not me. Uh -uh, I'm not accepting that number. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to warn the clerk about the coming mark of the beast, you know. But, you know, so let's not be superstitious about numbers, but God does use numbers, right? The Apostle Paul, he wrote 14 books. Oh, that's seven times two, right? But look, we're not like the dispensationalists. We don't believe in seven dispensations. We're not looking for numbers everywhere. But when the numbers are there, we'll observe it. We'll take note of it that God uses numbers for a particular reason. Um, I have found before that there are, uh, it, there's three different chapters ending in 19, or that have a chapter 19 dealing with rioting or crowds out of control. You think of... Uh, Genesis 19, Judges 19, Acts 19. There are other passages where it deals with not swearing or forswearing yourself that are all in the chapter number 5. Again, there's very interesting things. When you see something like that, take observation and just say, okay, cool, God's up to something here. Because you think about it, the, the Word of God was spoken through His prophets. It was not written down as it originated. Later it was written down, and then later the numbers were added, and yet God's hand is in it all. So don't be too super... Hey, and there's, yeah, you can look at all the 316s in the Bible. There's some really cool stuff there. But that doesn't mean that when you hit a 316 that doesn't match, that we need to throw it out. Maybe that shouldn't have been in there. No, just take what God's given you and don't look for more. Don't be superstitious. So I say all that to say that the seven pillars of wisdom, I think there's just the significance of God trying to show the perfection that is in wisdom. It comes from God. That's how He created the world. And there are pillars of heaven. There are pillars of earth that the Bible talks about both. Does it number them as seven? No, not in particular. But here we're told about God's perfect wisdom. And God's perfect wisdom wants us, I believe, to be soul winners, wants us to go out and seek the lost, to try to bring them in. And there's a lot of parallels in this chapter with soul winning. Look at, I want you to see, this is so interesting. Look at verse number four. It says, Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him. Now, wanteth means lacketh. So this is wisdom. It says, she crieth, what she's saying, if you're simple, or if you lack understanding, listen to this. Now that's wisdom speaking, but let's look at the foolish woman. Let's jump ahead to verse number 16. Look at verse number 16. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him. Now look, this is the call of foolishness. Did you guys see the parallel there? Those verses are identical except for one word, the word and. And I believe the Lord is trying to get our attention here to say, look, there's a battle going on between wisdom and foolishness. They're both personified as a woman, and one is, wisdom is crying, 
the foolish woman is calling out. So there's similarities. They're saying the same thing. They start off the same way, but yet what they're teaching is different and how they teach it is different. Their house is different and their end is different, right? The last word in this chapter is hell. That's the warning of where foolishness will take you. So we're going we're gonna to compare these verses first. Instead of going all the way through the chapter, we're going to compare them. Let's pick back up at verse number 1. Verse number 1. Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. Now, when wisdom builds her house, this reminds me of Proverbs 14, which will be there later. It says, every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. A, a, a woman that is wise, especially a woman that is saved and doing what God wants her to do, she's going to build up her house. She's going to take care of the people in her house. She's going to take care of the resources and be a good steward of what God has given her. Guess what? That wisdom comes from the Lord. Look at verse number two. She hath killed her beasts. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. Now, just because there's a stumbling block in here of the word wine, especially mingled wine, we actually have some mingled wine right here in the church building tonight. It's in the refrigerator. It's called apple juice. The apple juice is mingled from a bunch of different apples. Could be even from different countries these days. There's no telling. It is mingled. Wine simply means juice. Wisdom here is not offering alcoholic wine. Wisdom here is trying to give us an example of setting a table and preparing wisdom for people. So don't let the mingled wine throw you off. This is not an alcoholic drink. This is not strong drink. This is not liquor. Those are all words that the Bible uses. And to understand when wine is alcoholic or just unalcoholic juice, you have to read in context. So here, wisdom would not be breaking her own wisdom. We know in chapter 23 that it warns about the strong drink, about the wine that causes you to stumble and fall and be drunken. So that's not what's happening here. She hath killed her beast, she hath mingled her wine, she hath also furnished her table. She's getting stuff ready. Again, the Proverbs 31 woman, the virtuous woman, it says, she riseth while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. So wisdom would teach you to get things together, to provide for your own. Look at verse 3. She hath sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the high, highest places of the city. So now here we begin where wisdom is crying. She's sending forth her maidens. Now when it says the highest places of the city, you know, I think this could be referring to a holy place to begin with. Wisdom is right here in the church, and it's not just, it's, hey, it's from right here. It's from God. It's from His Word. It's from His Spirit. And that's the way it was back then. You, they would go and read the Bible in the temple. Now, also, also, you were teaching it at home. But she is yelling it. She's crying out, saying, hey, I've got some wisdom for you. Hey, I want you to grow. I want you to learn. I want you to understand. She's making it readily available. It's easy to find. Again, Bibles are very easy to find. I mean, there's probably everyone in here has more than one Bible. Most people in here probably have more than one Bible. If not, go to the dollar store, get an extra, right? You never know when they're going to stop selling them or when they start selling the wrong type. But, you know, this reminds me also in Luke chapter 14 where it says, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Wisdom says here that she's sending out her maidens. Wisdom of God is sending out his people to try to help the lost to get saved. And this is a big parallel we're going to see in the next few verses. And again, I believe Proverbs 9 gives us the picture of salvation and also warns against the foolishness, especially of those that have been rejected. Now we're going to jump ahead, look at verse number 10. This is the key verse for this chapter and also for the entire book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 9, verse number 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Now we're looking at a salvation picture, the application of salvation tonight, and this is the key verse. Those that fear the Lord, that's when wisdom begins. The world that rejects God, the children of the devil, they don't fear the Lord. They're not afraid of God. They don't respect God. They don't love God. They don't love His Word. They reject it. Therefore, God will reject them. Those are the fools that we're going to read about tonight. 
But here he says, knowledge of the holy is understanding. Look, once you're saved by believing God and his record that hell is real and that salvation is free, then you're saved. But then how do you grow as a Christian? Look, it's all about your choices. All along through the book of Proverbs, it's about choices. Everything we read should be about how do I apply this to my daily life, to my walk. Well, knowledge of the holy is understanding. When will I begin to understand life better? When will I understand my work better? When will I understand marriage better? It's when you have knowledge of the holy. Look, set this as your priority. Seek the word first, and then everything else will just make sense. Everything else will click. Everything else will fall in place. I want you to jump ahead to verse number 13. We're going to look at the comparison here. We saw wisdom crying. Now we're going to see the foolish woman calling. Proverbs 9, verse 13, it says, A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. Now this definition of simple here is very important. He's saying what a foolish woman is clamorous, she is simple and knoweth nothing. There's, there's four aspects here. Foolish equals simple. When Proverbs says you're a simple person, you're saying you're foolish. What does that mean? You know nothing. You lack understanding. You lack wisdom. So the foolish woman is simple. Now there's a difference, I believe, in this chapter and the application we're looking at tonight as far as salvation. The simple are who the fool is talking to and who the saved are talking to. So the simple is kind of like those in the middle. Like if somebody dies, dies in unbelief, they will go to hell. But all the more a reprobate. A child of the devil, when they die as a foolish person, they will go to hell also. So if they remain simple, they will end up foolish. And the foolish are trying to get the simple on their side. When we go out soul winning, the people we talk to are simple concerning the things of God. They know nothing of God's Word. Even those that claim to be Christians and quote verses, they don't have a grounded application. They don't really know what to do with the information since they have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, once you're saved, then you can build on that foundation. Everybody else really is simple, no matter how much head knowledge you have. So the first thing, the simple or foolish here, they know nothing. So the unsaved are simple. But I believe here the foolish woman that's calling out to the simple, this is a picture of a reprobate. Just remember that. This is, why, we, why does he keep warning about this foolish woman, this adulterous woman, this whorish woman? That's a reprobate. Look out. They're trying to ensnare you. Uh, but it, also, I want to talk about this for a second. It says clamorous. Clamorous. Clamorous means noisy. Clamorous means mouthy. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. She's a rebellious woman. Now, who's a mouthy, rebellious woman that comes to mind? Joyce Meyer. Joyce Meyer! How did you know? Look, Joyce Meyer is easy to hate. Joyce Meyer is a fool. She is clamorous. She is mouthy. She is not a Christian at all. If you look up the name Joyce Meyer, and you go to Wikipedia, and you read her own testimony that came out of her own books, she was abused by a reprobate father. Then she got married, and she was abused by, her, uh, by a reprobate husband. Then she got divorced, and she started going to pool halls and bowling alleys and bars where she met her next husband, Mr. Meyer. So she meets Mr. Meyer in a bar, David Meyer. Now, was, was he saved? Was he a wise person? Well, she goes on, and she says that one day while she was driving to work, now wait a minute, the woman's supposed to stay home and raise children. The woman should not be preaching over a pulpit. The Bible says that the steward, a pastor rather, is supposed to be a man having one wife. Joyce Meyer is divorced. She already broke that law. She's a woman. She broke it all the more, right? She is clamorous. She knoweth nothing. Joyce Meyer is a fool. And yet she, her, she brags. She's driving to work after meeting her second husband in a bar, and she has an epiphany. She sees light. Oh, God's talking to me. She sees a vision from God. What? Satan. Satan. She sees Satan, and guess what? Satan drags her. Oh, yeah, guess what? Let's go join the Lutheran church and start preaching and teaching. 
Joyce Meyer, an unsaved, probably a reprobate because she was abused, abused, and probably rejected God, looking in a bar for another husband, found one that sends her to work. She sees Satan driving down the road. She says it was God, and God told her to go to the Lutheran church and start preaching. Joyce Meyer is a wicked devil. She will go to hell. She preaches the wrong gospel. She preaches works-based salvation. She preaches bad doctrine that women should teach and, and lead in the church. She teaches a prosperity. She's worth millions and millions of dollars. I mean, I mean, her estate is well over 50 million, if not 100 million now. I don't know all the numbers. It doesn't really matter. Hey, she's not a man of God. She's a witch. According to the Bible, according to the Bible, what, what should you do with a witch? Somebody that gets up and uses God's name vainly. Somebody that seduces God's servants. There are people searching for God. And when they go in the bookstore and they look in the Christian section, and then there's this short-haired, ugly dyke that bosses around her husband she found in a bar, and he's along for the ride. Well, the devil told her to preach at the Lutherans. I'm, I'm in for it. Now she's a Pentecostal. Who cares? What's the difference? Neither one are saved. They will both end up in hell. Proverbs 9.13 describes her to a T. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. Hey, in Proverbs 7 we read that she is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. She's not at home taking care of her husband. She is out on the road preaching, flying around in a million dollar jet, bragging about how she's the man of God. What a fool. What a fool. She looks like a man, don't she? It's an ugly dude. Look, look at verse number 14 here, Proverbs 9, 14. So we're warned about this foolish woman working for the devil, right? That's a reprobate. For she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high place of the city. So there she is. She's in her seat in her house, and she's calling out to people. Look at the next verse. To call passengers who go right on their ways. Foolishness. Hey, I got some foolishness for you. Right? That's the, the prince of the power of the airwaves that you hear when you turn on the radio. I don't care what channel you land on, political, uh, <laughs> Hispanic, probably. I can't verify it, but I'd be willing to bet even the Hispanic channel is, is pushing out Satan's doctrine. Well, this is a conservative Christian talk network. No, it's not. No, it's not. That's a lie of the devil. Jesus would not be a Republican. He would not be a Democrat. They're both socialists. They're both fascists. They're both destroying our country. To call passengers right on their way. Listen, the words of, of a foolish woman are smooth. You guys remember that from chapter 5? It said, For the lips of the strange woman drop as in honeycomb, for her mouth is smoother than oil. That's what Proverbs 5 warned us about. Proverbs 6, it says, To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Proverbs chapter 7, it says, With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. How's the devil going to work? How's the devil going to get his people to try to attack those in the middle? By calling out to them. Did you hear that new song by so-and-so? Did you hear, oh, who, 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 I mean, name somebody, Beyonce, children of the devil. Jay-Z, child of the devil. Right? Name one. They're all children of the devil. Madonna, don't even go there. She's literally a witch in the church of Satan. So is Jim Carrey. So is Hillary Clinton. These people work for the devil and they want to deceive the masses. They're calling out to the simple, hey, we got an easy way. Hey, come check out the things that you can lust after. Whereas wisdom is over here warning us, trying to compel us saying, come on, you need understanding. You need to fear God to be saved, to save your soul. Verse 15, to call passengers who go right on their way. Again, th these are reprobates, I believe. They've rejected the gospel, and it's like a whorish woman. They're disgusting. They're trying to draw other people into their sin. Now, let's take a reset here. So this is the, the foolish. We looked at the wise woman. We looked at the foolish woman. Let's go back to the wise woman and see how, what her message is. Look at verse number 4. Proverbs chapter 9, verse number 4. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him. Remember, wanteth means lacketh. Hey, you that don't have knowledge, hey, you that don't have understanding, come to me, wisdom is saying, the wisdom of the Lord. Look at verse 5. Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Now, again, I believe there's a salvation parallel to the wise. 
Well, what's the bread of the wise? Hey, Jesus said, I am that bread of life. Right? Jesus is the bread. Jesus is that water. Once you drink it, you have it forever. Once you're saved, you're always saved. In Matthew 26, Jesus took his disciples and he took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took up the cup and gave them thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. You say, why do you guys actually do communion here? Well, because that's what Jesus did. He told his disciples to do the same. He said the wine represents the blood he would spill. The bread represents his body that would be broken for us. And that is the New Testament. Amen. This is the new covenant. It is a picture that we no longer sacrifice a lamb. Hey, Christ is our Passover. Yeah. But we sit down together as a congregation and we remember that Christ is the bread. Christ is the wine. And again, Proverbs 9 gives us that picture of salvation and also warns against the foolish that have rejected. Come and eat of my bread, verse, verse 5, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Verse 6, forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. Forsake the false gospel and live. Forsake trusting in your own works and be saved. Forsake ray comfort and live. Yeah. Right? Forsake the Lutheran church and live. Yes. Jesus said, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He's made us a promise. He's given us a picture. And I believe that Proverbs 9 is like a soul winner's proverb to remind you what we're doing, what God has called us unto. Notice this dinner is free. Notice that she's not charging. Right? Just like when he sent them out into the highways and hedges, it was a free dinner. The bread is free. The wine is free. It costs you nothing for salvation. Jesus paid it all. He broke his body. He spilled his blood so that you don't have to spill your blood. It's a beautiful picture of salvation. But, you know, again, hey, the devil's also calling his children by the mouth of foolishness. By the foolish of the world, like a whore trying to draw you away from God. Well, what does the foolish say? Let's compare it. Let's go back to verse number 16. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him. Now remember, lacking understanding, right? Look, verse number 10 is the key to this chapter. Verse number 10 is the key to the entire book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So the goal is, the devil is trying to get them away from the knowledge of the holy. Get them away from the fear of the Lord. Look at verse 17. Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Now isn't that interesting? There's a parallel there. Hey, we have the body of Christ as bread for our salvation. We have the bread of life. And yet the devil is saying, eat some stolen bread. Eat that bread in secret. Trying to be deceiving. Hey, God knows your thoughts and intentions. Hold your finger here. Go to Proverbs chapter 5. Hold your finger in this chapter, Proverbs chapter 5. Remember where he said, hey, the good man is not home, right? No one will know. God knows your heart. God knows your path. He watches the steps you take. He knows the thoughts and the intentions of your heart. You can't do something wrong and then say, well, I didn't mean to. That's not what I meant to happen. God knows what you were thinking when you did what you did. You can't lie to God. You can lie to people. You can deceive people. And the devil knows that. The devil wants to deceive the simple with the mouth of foolishness and try to cause them to fall. Try to call them to reject the gift of salvation so they believe a lie. They think they're getting something for free by stealing. Hey, we know what we have is free, but stolen bread is no good. Look here in Proverbs 5. Look at verse 15. Proverbs 5, 15. Drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. There's a warning here. Hey, you got your own wife, right? Don't drink those stolen waters. Drink what's free. Drink what's yours. Drink what is rightful and honest, and the devil wants to do it any other way than the right way. If he can get you to compromise just a little bit, then he can get you to compromise a whole bunch. Look, if he can get you to just start wondering if it's better over there, well, you know, I know that other guy, and he doesn't even go to church, and he's got all this stuff. Look, don't let the devil get the seed in, in your heart, that little bit of leaven, thinking, well, maybe, maybe I'm doing all this stuff for naught. Maybe I'm serving the Lord and there's no real benefit right now. Maybe there's no real purpose. I mean, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. What else do I have to worry about? 
Look, Proverbs is about your daily choices, your minute to minute choices, what you're thinking, what you're doing, and God wants you to walk in wisdom and that's your choice. And when you choose to, you'll be blessed of him. While you're in this chapter, look at verse four of this woman, he warns, he says, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Proverbs 5.5, 5, her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Go back to chapter 9. So we're warned about this foolish woman. Her end is hell. She wants to take you to hell. The devil is trying to seduce the world through music and TV and false religion and fornication to go away from God. There are people that will reject the gospel because of fornication. Look, you can't repent of your sins to be saved, but some people put their sin as such an idol in their, their life that they don't want salvation. Well, then I'll have to deal with this thing that I love. Well, make a decision. God doesn't want you to fall. God wants you to succeed. Look, you're back in Proverbs 9. Look at verse number 18. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. The devil uses a foolish desire to trap the simple. Those simple in the middle that could get out and be saved, he wants to trap them and ensnare them with their own desire and cause them to sin against God. Go to Proverbs 14, keeping your finger in Proverbs 9. Proverbs 14. Look at verse number 18. It says, The simple inherit folly but the prudent are crowned with knowledge right the simple will become foolish if they stay on that path the foolish are trying to get the simple out of the way but we want to be wise it says the prudent are crowned with knowledge the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge once you search after God you will find it he will give you more understanding then he will give you wisdom you'll know what to do with it and guess what you're gonna do wisdom will speak through you and you'll say to that simple man hey don't go there don't pass by her house don't go that way her way is the depth of hell the simple inherit folly don't do that you'll inherit hell what do you have to look forward to foolishness hell destruction misery in this life that's not, what, that's not what God wants for us. That's why he gives us wisdom and helps us to make the right decisions. Keep your finger in Proverbs 14. Go back to Proverbs chapter 9. Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. That's our warning about how foolishness works. And it's not always a battle that we fight. We're going to transition here. We're going to go to the middle verses. Look at verse number 7. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame. And he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Now there's a concept here the Bible's teaching is that sometimes people don't want to hear what you have to say. Yep. Right? There is somebody that used to be in this church, and I tried to help. I thought, man, I'm just trying to help you see the right thing in the right way. And they kept rejecting it. They got to the point they hated me. They hate our church. Guess what? Go. Leave. Go somewhere else. It was a blot unto me. I poured out my heart trying to help this person, and, and they rejected it. They probably considered my wisdom foolishness. All I want to do is say, don't continue on that path. You'll have a problem. Don't keep going down that way. You'll destroy yourself. It says, He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame. And he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Look, there are even Christians that have a wicked heart toward their sin. If you have a brother or sister in Christ that's a drunkard, they think smoking pot's cool and it's okay. God didn't mention it and God made all the plants and God wouldn't make a law against plants. Okay, well, what happened in Genesis? He sure did, right? But they, well, God, it's okay. That's not, I am sober. I think better when I'm high. Hey, you're a fool. The Bible says to be sober, to be clear-minded. And somebody that is saved can continue in that. And when you try to tell them, hey, man, don't do that. Hey, God warned about it. Hey, let me give you this first. Don't you think it would please the Lord to keep his laws? But you get yourself a blot if you keep going. Sometimes it's a shame unto you how much time you spend with people. There's somebody like that in my past, and I look now, and it's like, now I'm almost like, man, I'm afraid of you, lest I've labored in vain. 
I spent all this time trying to help you and you didn't want my help, it was a shame. You help those that want the help. You help those that can't help themselves, but somebody that can help themselves and refuses God's help and refuses God's wisdom, saved or unsaved, there's a time to take a walk. There's a time to quit worrying about them, knock the dust off your shoes and go on down the road. Well, are you saying they'll never be saved? No, hey, not necessarily. When you knock on somebody's door and they reject you, that doesn't mean that was their last time. There could be somebody that comes back next week and waters that seed again, and maybe they're successful. Maybe, maybe they didn't like your haircut, right? But look, we keep going. We just, okay, well, cool. I'm not going to waste time. I'm going to move on down the road. Look at Proverbs 14. You have your finger there. Look at, go back to 14. It says in verse number 7, Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. Once you realize you're talking to a fool, the Bible says just take a hike. Don't make it a blot on you. Don't make it a shame unto you. When you perceive that there's no wisdom in there, walk away for your own good. I was talking to a guy earlier this week, and you know the, 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 the proverb that a fool is known by the multitude of his words came to mind. And there were several things I was going to say to this guy, and then this proverb keeps coming back to my mind, and it's like, you know what? I'm just going to walk away. There's nothing I could tell him that would benefit him, because he knows it all. He's got a story for everything, and he's got an excuse for everything, and he's got, you know what? See you later. No, actually, I won't. Bye. Just bye. Hey, thank you for your time. Have a great day. I'm out of here. I'm not going to waste my time with you. I want you to go to Proverbs 26. We're almost done here. Proverbs chapter 26. Now remember in Proverbs 9 he said that he, he that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a, wa a wicked man getteth to himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. <coughs> Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. There are people I have rebuked and, and they ha it was clear they had wisdom when they came back and said, you know what, you're right. Man, I'm sorry, I messed that up. You know what, and hey, I've been in the same boat. I have been rebuked, and instead of, well, you don't know what you're, hey, leave me alone. I, no, 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 you know what? I, I messed up. Thank you for trying to help me see things clearly. Thank you for trying to help pull that moat out of my eye. Thank you, brother, right? That's the attitude we ought to have as Christians when somebody, you know, because pride usually gets in the way of Christians helping Christians. And usually it's the rebuker that has too much pride, but there is that time where you may be rebuked. You say, you know what, this guy's speaking in the mouth of God's wisdom, and he's being honest with me, and he's not trying to lord over me. He's just trying to say, hey, hey, man, you know, you messed up. You said something wrong. Fess up to it. Fix the problem. Humble yourself, and God will lift you up. Why do we reject people after the second and third admonition? Why don't we just stand there and go, go to battle with them? Look, there's a time to fight. There's a time to stand in the gate and argue and defend the city and, you know, face your enemies head on. But why do we, why do we walk after the second and third admonition? Look, you're in Proverbs 26. Look at verse number 1. As snow in the summer and as rain in the harvest, so honor is not seemly for a fool. If you rebuke a fool, they're not going to receive it. When you give them your wisdom, you're casting your pearls before the swine. They see zero value in the wisdom of God. And when you speak on God's behalf and say, hey, you know what? God warned about that. Hey, you shouldn't do that. They have zero value to your words, to God's wisdom when you give it to them. It's not seemly. Honor is not seemly for a fool. Look at verse 2. As the bird by wandering and the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. I say when somebody gets cursed, it's not without cause. Somebody caused their own curse, is what this is saying. Just as the fool, when they reject knowledge, God will reject them. When they reject wisdom, and then they cry unto wisdom, and the wisdom says, I'm not going to answer you. You had your chance, and now you became a fool. It's too late for you. Look at verse number three. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. I love that verse. I always say that, should, that would make a great motivational poster, right? And a rod for the fool's back, right? Look at verse 4. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Why after the first and second or even third admonition do we reject somebody and walk away so that we don't become a fool? 
so that we don't stand there and argue about the legitimacy of the Catholic Church with somebody, so that we don't argue about which of Joseph Smith's writings were inspired and which are not. That'd be foolish, wouldn't it? Look, he was a heretic. He was a reprobate. He was a pervert. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be also like unto him. Sometimes a fool will pose a question in such a way just to get you to answer according to their way. That's why Brother Ben asked me a question the other day, and he comes up and he says, okay, so if this verse, would you say this? And I'm like, what are you getting at, Brother Ben? Feels like you're trying to back me in a corner. Now, he wasn't. He was onto something. But, you know, sometimes people will try to trick you. Well, if you look at this verse, wouldn't you say it says this? Uh, sure, why? Aha! Therefore, you've contradicted. No, 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 I didn't say that. Look, a fool wants to try to ensnare you in his words. A fool wants you to answer him according to his folly. Look at the next verse, though. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Now this time it's saying, you answer him with wisdom so he knows he's not wise. You answer him according to his folly, not in his saying. So what he's saying is, you answer to show that he's a fool. Kind of like Brother Luke preached about carbon dating. Well, you Christians believe in a young earth, but how come this carbon dating and that carbon dating. Uh, I don't know, maybe the carbon dating, no, that's answering a fool, right? But now if they keep on, well, guess what? I'm going to answer this fool lest he be wise in his own conceit. And like Brother Luke pointed out, well, how come when you do a living, uh, what was it, walrus? Is that what you said? Or a, a living snail in carbon dating, it says it's hundreds of thousands of years old. That's answering a fool according to his folly. Well, guess what? The whole test is flawed. The whole test is foolishness. Let me prove that rather than trying to debate whether this level or that level or this fossil or that fossil. You see what I'm saying? So the Bible is saying there is a way to answer a fool, and it's in wisdom to highlight the fact that the fool doesn't have any wisdom. Let's read both of those again. Answer not, verse 4, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Don't get in a fight where you lose your cool you're the fool also. Look at verse 5. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. The conceited fool, sometimes you need to knock their legs out and show them that God is bigger than them. Let God's wisdom speak through you. And when a fool is talking to you, trying to get to back you in a corner, Lord, show me what, how to answer this fool. Lord, help me answer this because I don't want to ensnare myself and I don't want to be like them. But, Lord, they're obviously boasting against you. Lord, give me the wisdom to answer this fool. And God will. Look at verse 6. He that sendeth a message by the hand of a fool cutteth off the feet and drinketh damage. The legs of the lame are not equal, and so is the parable in the mouth of fools. Go back to chapter 9. So again, he's just going back to saying, a fool doesn't know what he's talking about. A fool can't even tell a joke right. It can't give you a parable right. And it's uneven. His ways are unstable. And don't be like him by giving in to his ways, but allow God's wisdom to work through you to highlight their foolishness, showing God's wisdom. So here, as we see back in Proverbs chapter 9, the, the parallels between the wise, the wisdom of the saved versus the foolishness of the unsaved. There is a battle for souls in the middle. We have been called to fight this battle. These people are simple. They know nothing. We need to teach them something. We need to preach the gospel to them. If they don't want to increase their understanding of the holy, they can never leave that status of being simple. They may eventually become totally foolish. It's up to us to try to give them the word of God and build on the foundation and pull them out of the fire. Pull them out of that slump of just being foolish, being simple, not understanding. In the meanwhile, we can rebuke a wise man and he'll love you. Look at verse number 9 where we picked up, we're picked off there. Proverbs 9.9, 9, give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. Look, in the church, I look around, I see a bunch of wise people. I didn't say wise guys. I said wise people, wise men and women, because you have chosen to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have that seed in you. You have the fear of God. You want a knowledge of the holy. That's something God can work with. That's something God can build upon. And he says, give instruction to a wise man. That's what this is. That's what we're doing tonight. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. That's why I love the, the fellowship here, because I'm not the only teacher. God did not put one teacher in Steadfast Baptist Church of Jacksonville. He gave us a bunch of teachers. 
And I love the fact that God's Holy Spirit can work through you and I can learn from you guys just as much as I can learn from the Word of God. Because you're studying the Word, you're praying, you're humbling yourself before God, you fear God, God will work through you. And God wants you to desire the better gifts, right? He has set people in the church, He builds the church, we are the body of Christ, it tells us, and we are members in particular. God brought all of us together for a reason, it's to help each other, and there are apostles and preachers and teachers, and we need more teachers probably than anything else. You know, it says that we should covet earnestly the best gifts. We should desire to be able to preach and to teach God's Word with authority, just as Jesus did. That's His goal for us, is to let wisdom work through us. When we get fighting with fools, we're not going to win. When you try to be like the simple because of the cares of the world, you're not going to win. You're not going to grow. You will never be a teacher if you choose to remain simple as a Christian. Look at verse number 10. Again, the key verse in this chapter. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. That is the key verse for the entire book of Proverbs. Look at verse 11. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. Listen, there's God's blessing to the obedient. Receive his wisdom and live. Verse 12. If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. But if thou scornest, thou alone shalt bear it. Look, this is a self-help verse. Did you catch what it said there? Thou shalt be wise for thyself. Don't go to, to the bookstore and look for a self-help book. God already gave you one. And right in the middle of it, it says you need to fear God, right? And if you choose that wisdom, you will help yourself. You will help every aspect of your life. You'll have more understanding once you have knowledge of the holy. Be wise. Help yourself. How? Being afraid of God. Being afraid of the judgment of God. Being afraid of walking away from the ministry He's given you. The family, the friends. Being afraid of not obeying Him. You need to fear God. And once you're truly afraid, once you're afraid, hey, He also commanded you to read His Word. To study the Bible and to teach others. How, you need to increase your learning of what the Bible says and make that your number one priority. Yeah, but Brother Fan, you understand, I got this opportunity at work, and if I just study, 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 I might get that promotion. Listen, promotions come from God. Knowledge comes from God. God can help you with knowledge at a time that you need it, where you don't have a, 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 a book knowledge of it, because you have the Bible knowledge. God will open your eyes and help you to see things like no one else. The self-help verse, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Hey, study to sh show yourself approved unto God, not to your boss, not to your wife, not to your friends in your, in, in your workplace. Everything will just make sense. You'll have peace in life and you'll understand all things when you make these things your priority. Fear and knowledge. Fear and knowledge. And guess what? Wisdom and folly use the same line. Remember verse 4, verse 16, either one. It says, whoso is simple let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith, right, there's that cry of wisdom, hey, you need to know something more in life? Start with this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now that you know what he wants you to do, now that you're saved, try to live as a righteous Christian. Obey his commandments if you love God, and he will take care of the rest of the details. Yeah, but what about my job? What about my wife? What about my... Trust the Lord, and he will give you everything you need. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the book of Proverbs. Lord, thank you for this church. Lord, thank you for the wise people that are here. Lord, thank you for giving me wisdom. Lord, I love you, and you've been merciful to all of us in so many different ways. And Lord, we just want to grow in our understanding of the holy. Lord, we want children in this church to grow up loving you and being soul winners. And Lord, thank you for this interesting lesson about the parallels between wisdom and folly. Lord, I pray you would help us to apply it to our everyday walk and serve you. Lord, I love you and I ask that you would protect us as we leave from here and help us all to get better in our Christian walk. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.